And Father, even as we were reminded last week, Martha was busy with the many things, and yet Mary was captivated with the one thing. And just, Lord, help us to be like that this morning, that we be just caught up, captivated, drawn to that place of just sitting at your feet, Lord Jesus, and adoring you and worshiping you. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. And overwhelmed, and how your mercy fell could change the heart as hard as mine. I tried to turn away, deny the hand you gave, but you refused to leave my side. Wonderful God, wonderful God.
stand in the midst of a multitude of those from every tribe.
Let's pray. Father, just thank you for the joy of being here this morning with your people in your presence. Is there a better place to be? And Lord, let our hearts be open to all that you would speak, all that you would do. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, two Tim, uh, to, sorry, two Thessalonians, chapter 2 from verse 1 onwards. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation is not of error, nor of uncleanness, nor in deception. But even as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the good news or the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who tests our hearts. For neither were we at any time found using words of flattery, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor seeking glory from men, neither from you nor from anyone else or others, when we might have claimed authority as apostles of Christ. Verse 7, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Even so, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the good news of God, but also our own souls, because you'd become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and travail for working night and day that we may not burden any of you. We preach to you the good news of God. You are witnesses with God how holy, righteously, and blamelessly we behaved ourselves towards you who believed. Verse 11, as you know, we exhorted, comforted, and implored every one of you as a father does his own children, to the end that you should walk worthily of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this cause we also thank God without ceasing, that when you received from us the word of the message of God, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also works in you who believe. Paul and Silas had planted this church in Thessalonica, uh, but then Acts 17.5, tells us that the Jews there were jealous and they caused a huge uproar in the whole city. And when Paul and Silas had then moved on, probably many of those same people started slandering them and saying, well, these men were only out to deceive you. They preached falsehoods to you and they were just there to take your money. You can't trust them. That was what they kept trying to say to these new Christians. You can't trust these men. So Paul answers these accusations by just emphasizing what they didn't do and what they did do. Firstly, what they didn't do. And these things really ought to be true of all of our lives if we really are going to ever be God's instruments, God's witnesses to the world, to people around us and to our own families, if we really are going to be effective, these things need to be so. Verse 3, our appeal does not spring from error or uncleanness. It is not made with guile. Now, words like doctrine and theology nowadays are not all that popular. But it really, really is important for us to have sound doctrine and good solid biblical theology. Paul urges us in 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're never going to show yourself approved by watching Christian TV or reading all sorts of Christian books or even by listening to me preach. You have to take the personal responsibility to study, to show yourself approved, and to study what? 
Mercifully, Paul then goes on to tell you what you've got to study. He says, you've got to study the word of truth. You read your Bible. Simple as that. And the more you read your Bible, coming without any agenda, coming with an open and, open and a humble heart saying, Lord, you show me, Lord, teach me from your word, the better your doctrine will get. Every time you come to God's word just with an open heart, not trying to prove any theories that you have, but just say, Lord, show me, teach me, lead me, your doctrine will get better. So Paul says we didn't make our appeal to you in any kind of error. We had proper doctrine. We also didn't have any impure motives or guile or deception. We really came with pure hearts. And then verse 4, God has entrusted us with the good news. We did not, or we do not speak to please men. Because we have the sacred trust from God, God has entrusted us with the gospel. And because of that, we didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. But we told you the truth that you desperately needed to hear. We live in a time when we are greatly, greatly pressured to embrace and accept everyone and anything and the way they choose to behave and just accept it all. In the 40 years I've been a Christian, I've seen the church take major, major shifts on things like homosexuality, unmarried people living together, things like that. The, sh the church has, has moved significantly in the past 30 or 40 years. I even heard of one church where one of the worship leaders is living with his girlfriend. But the church don't ever confront it because the man happens to be a talented musician. So he can live with his girlfriend, sleep with her through the week, come and lead worship Sunday morning. But this shift has happened in many, many different areas. All of it just because of this relentless pressure from the world just to embrace and accept and love everything except Jesus Christ. Except Jesus. You can talk about anything. You can say whatever you like. Just don't talk about Jesus. A woman came into our shop this week. And she asked Josh if he wanted to buy some haunted dolls. And Josh said, no, not particularly. So the woman said she knew that the dolls were haunted because it hurt every time she touched them. So she took the dolls off to a Reiki healer who told her that the dolls were very upset because the owner had taken their clothes off. And then she still had the nerve to get upset with Josh when he did the only proper thing to do in a situation like that is when he laughed at her. <laughs> she got upset with him. I read the ramblings of a young woman from Howick the other day who said she was just so grateful that a certain one of these, also these Reiki healers or whatever they are, had put her in touch with her dead mother and her dead grandmother. And as if that wasn't bad enough, people were all writing on her thing and saying, oh, that's so wonderful for you and so lovely that you're talking to your dead granny and your dead mummy. It's just so lovely. And, and Paul's stark statement as he came in and shook that sinful, idol-worshipping city to the foundations and he caused a vibrant living church to spring up there, he said, we simply did not speak to please men. That's how we did it. And maybe we really just very simply needed to be reminded of that this morning. I do not speak to please men. Instead, I choose to speak God who tests the heart. God is the only one who really knows the heart. Verse 5, we never flattered. We never coveted anyone's money. Similarly, they didn't flatter anyone. They didn't tell them how wonderful they were. And a huge part of the reason why they were able to not flatter anybody was the huge issue that they weren't after their money. The reason people flatter other people is because they want their money. How much compromise has there been in Christian circles down through the centuries? How many churches and whole denomination groupings have ended up in a mess? All because of the whole thing of compromise over money. 
And Paul was able to say with absolute conviction, we weren't in it for the money. I believe one of the greatest testimonies of this little church is that we never ask you for money. I've never ever asked you in 20 whatever years for your money. After the very, very first very disappointing meeting I did when I went into full-time ministry in 1991, where the people never gave me a cent. I drove all the way to Durban to do a meeting. They never gave me a cent. It was accountants. A whole bunch of Christian accountants, by the way. But, <laughs> but on the way home, the Lord spoke to me. And really, and, and I don't often claim that God speaks to me, but spoke very, very clearly to me. And he said, this is the deal. If you're going to serve me, you will never ask any man for money. And you will never make your needs known to any man. There will be no dropping of hints. There'll be no wearing your poverty on your sleeve. And I said, well, okay, Lord, I accept the deal. And when you take a, a decision like that, you're going to be sorely and often tested in it. You will be tested. And I remember when we were still doing Joy magazine, we were looking after our own four children, and we were also looking after four Zulu children at that time. All we had to transport the whole family was a very old Honda Ballard, that eventually, I think eventually ended up doing close to half a million kilometers. One of those old Honda flips, you know. The, and at one point, the engine of the car had overheated and was in a very, very bad way. So God sent a man called Dr. Bataza, who flew all the way from Syria, a Syrian Christian doctor. Helen interviewed him for the magazine. At the end of the interview, he said, what is your need? We said, no, we're fine. We, we don't have any needs. He said, no, no, no. He, he was a very pushy man. And he said, God has told me that you have a very specific need. So eventually we admitted that the car was running on its last legs. It needed a, a new, not a new, but a new reconditioned engine. And so he just paid for the whole thing. And, and we didn't drop hints. We said nothing. In fact, we tried our best. To put him off but God knows and God does and that's the way we've lived since then that's the way this church operates and yes some people will take advantage of that come here for years and years and never put anything in and they they're answerable to God for that not to me not my problem others will thrive in it be able to do real New Testament giving real New Testament giving is 2 Corinthians 9 6 and 7 remember this he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let each man live according as he has determined in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. That's New Testament giving. Verse 6, we didn't seek any man's praise. Similar to flattery, we weren't looking for praise from anyone. Paul knew that it is God who vindicates. God who justifies and not man. And so he lived in that. He never expected people to thank him, to praise him, to say, well, you did well or you preached a wonderful sermon or whatever. He, he didn't have that expectation. Verse 9, we worked night and day and burdened nobody. He proves his statement about money by saying they actually worked hard in secular work. In his case, making tents. So as not to be a burden. Not to have to keep asking for money all the time. And then, having said, these are the things we didn't do. There are accusations against us, but we didn't do this. He says in verse 10, You and God are witnesses. Our behavior was holy, righteous, blameless. And that's very good, and that's the way we need to live. Vitally important that our behavior, both in the church and to people out in the world, is holy, righteous, blameless in, in all areas. But then he gets to the real issue. He says, we gave you the one thing that these accusers have never given you. In all the years they've been among you, they've never given you this one thing. We gave you love. And in fact, Paul, all that he's been saying up until that point, 
so far as practical evidence of their love for them. If you truly do love people, you're not going to lead them into error and into a gospel of compromise. You're not going to be doing it in treachery or guile. You're not going to be doing it with any ulterior motives. If you truly love people, your times are going to tell them the truth that they need to hear and not the truth that their ears want to hear. You won't be flattering them all the time, telling them what wonderful little sugar dumplings they are. But you will all the time be urging them to follow me as I follow Christ. And very, very importantly, if you truly do love them, you won't be after their money. And just look at the language. You know, this is Paul speaking. Verse 7. We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Verse 8. We are affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart you, to impart you not the good news of God only, but also our own souls. It literally means we gave you our very lives because you had become very dear to us. Verse 9, we labored night and day so as not to be a burden to you. Verse 11, we exhorted, comforted, charged every one of you as a father does his own children. Paul says, we were like the most nurturing of all things you could possibly think of. A breastfeeding mother to you. We were like loving fathers. I was like a loving father, says Paul, to you. You've become very dear to us. We gave you our very lives. And even now my soul is affectionately longing for you. And so he says this is the true gospel of God's love. That these accusers were never able to give to you. This is true love. It's what he's saying. Not giving people false hope that they can talk to their dead granny or their dead mommy. Not charging them good money to help their little dollies get over their bad temper. Not having ungodly motives. Not wanting their money. But loving them enough to have the guts to keep calling them back into God's truth. And to leave behind the world's ways. Urging them over and over and over and over again to keep looking unto Jesus. That's love. And it's having the life and the authority to be able, like Paul did in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, to say, follow me or imitate me as I follow or imitate Christ. Having that authority, that ability to be able to say, look to me, look, follow me, imitate me in the same way that I am following Jesus Christ. You see, it's, it's easy to love people up to your point of convenience. We can love them while we're telling rugby stories or army stories or even while we're telling them Jesus stories. Perhaps we can even love them enough to give them a couple of hundred rands or help out a little bit here or there. But I'm just so painfully aware of how far, far short I come of Paul's standards. I loved you way, way beyond the point of convenience. I loved you like a mother. I loved you like a father. I gave my whole life to you. I loved you when it was very, very inconvenient to do so. Jesus said in a sense, you take all the law and the prophets and all the details and you wrap them up into two very, very simple things. Love God with everything you've got. Love others as much as you love yourself. And then he says, just to confirm it, he says there are no commandments that are greater than these. There's nothing else bigger than that. And we can so easily lose sight of the fact that love is the most spiritual of all things. Love is the most spiritual of all things. 
Do you want to know the way into the increase of God's love? Uh, sorry, increase of God and, and His all that He has for you. It's only by love. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, if you've got all the gifts, you give everything away, you offer up even your whole life to be a martyr, but you don't have love, you are nothing. And you are very definitely not spiritual. Isn't that a thing? You've done all of this stuff, given and given and done and done. But if it hasn't been done in love, you haven't even begun to be spiritual. And he goes on to say that for the truly spiritual, for the really mature, three simple things remain. Faith, hope, love, and love is the greatest of them all. But before he even talks about love in 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about the way in which these people were not loving. He addresses that way back in 1 Corinthians 11. Because he says there were factions and there were divisions in the church. He's talking about taking the Lord's communion or the Lord's Supper. And, and over the years I've wondered how, when, the, when they had communion, did they have this whole full-on meal? Uh, because Paul is saying in a sense, when you, when you come together for communion, you pick out. You, some are left hungry, others have eaten until they can't eat anymore. And I'm not exactly sure how it worked. But I really felt the Lord showing me that while remember his, remembering his broken body, his shed blood is very important, there's a direct commandment of God to do so, which we, as I've said before, take care very seriously. We do it every week because God told us to do it as often as we can. But what I felt the Lord saying is that in our context, maybe the real love feast comes when we have tea afterwards. It's a case of, well, I, don't, I, I know they don't have a lot of chocolate digestive biscuits. There's only one packet. The Lord understands that I'm not all that impartial to lemon creams. So let me rush to the tea table, lay hold of as many chocolate digestives as possible, so I can get there before anyone else gets there. That's what he's talking about. Isn't it? And that gets ramped up even more when we have a bring and share lunch together. That, that, the whole thing gets then on steroids. But again, Paul leaves us weighed, measured, found wanting. When he says, I worked long into the night so that I did not have to scrounge a single chocolate digestive biscuit from any of you. That's the context. Love is the most difficult and the greatest of all things. Paul says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 6.12, You are not restricted by us. We haven't put restrictions on you. You are restricted by your own affections. The reason why you're so narrow, so limited, all hedged in, pent up, frustrated, cramped, is because you simply don't love enough. The measure of your spiritual life right now is no greater than your heart. All the knowledge that, that's in your head right now is not the measure of your spirituality. The way for your release and your increase and your abundance in God is by way of the heart. Spirituality is not mental agreement with things that are said in God's Word. It's the melting of one heart to another to all the saints. The only way out of your spiritual restriction is through an increase of love. And we'll stay locked up until we get there. And so, because of the great example that Paul set, because of the things he didn't do, like being greedy and deceitful, because he was like a caring mother and a loving father to them, the Thess Thessalonian believers really just took off in God. They became truly spiritual people. Paul was able to say to them in 1 Thessalonians 1 
verses 2 and 3, we give thanks to God for you always, remembering without ceasing your work. What was their work? Just look at this work that they were doing. Your work in, in those three important spiritual areas that he speaks about in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope. These are truly spiritual people. He didn't say you, 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 you've all got doctorates in, of theology and you're all doing this and that and studying so hard. He says, we give thanks for you and remember with, without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. Spiritual people. Isn't it significant that in the Corinthian church where there was an abundance of spiritual gifts, very spiritually gifted people, that's where all the problems were. But here in this church that is just quietly doing the right thing, work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope, Paul says in verse 7, you've become an example to many, many other churches, many other believers. And because Paul had earned the right through his great example of love, and even though he says in, ver in chapter 4, verse 9, we don't really need to write to you about loving each other because you've be already been taught to do so by God. Despite that, he says, and as I said, he has the authority to do so because of the great example that he set to them. He says in chapter 3, verse 12, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. You're loving lots. In fact, you're the great example to other churches. But don't rest on your laurels. Don't think you've arrived. Love even more. And if you thought I was talking nonsense, I know that little togolosh well. That if you thought I was talking nonsense when I said love is the most spiritual of all things. You thought, no, nah, man, you know, obedience and this and that. He's talking nonsense. I'm going to catch you now. Because just look at what Paul says next. He says you're loving lots, but you need to love more. Why? Verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What a thing. Love more so that you, your hearts may be blameless in holiness. What is going to take you to these great spiritual heights of being blameless in holiness? Paul says, love, nothing else, full stop. And so, because of this great example that was set by Paul of no ulterior motive, loving like a mother and father, because Paul had authority to say to them, you need to love even more because of the example he had set, just look at the fruit you get. In 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and you took my advice in 1 Thessalonians. The love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. The love of every single one of you in that church abounds towards everybody else. And so he's able to say in the next verse, now we're not just using, and you're not just an example to other churches, but we actually boast about you. We boast. We're not supposed to boast, but we can boast in the Lord. We boast about you to everybody else. And as I said, I believe we've all been found, weighed, measured, found wanting in this area. Especially when you have the example of this man, Paul, before us. A man who could be very, very hard, very straight at times. 
And yet he says here, I set the example for you. I loved you like a nursing mother, caring father. I, I loved and I loved and I loved. And I believe the Lord would urge us this morning. You've tried many, many different ways to become more spiritual. You read your Bible more, you fasted, you prayed, you went to church. And yes, you've loved, but you've loved to the point of convenience. And God would say to us this morning, are you willing to do it my way? Are you willing, like Paul, to love way beyond your level of convenience? Are you willing to take very seriously the device, the advice that Paul gave to this church? May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all. Not just to one another here, but to all out there. And I believe God's promise to us would be that if we do, God may one day be able to say to us as a church, your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. The Lord would say, I believe, test me in this. Just cut out super spiritual stuff. Test me in this in a sense. Just love more than you do right now. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Lord, it, 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 it's a huge, huge challenge to us. When you see a man like Paul who was so straight, almost seemed harsh at times, so uncompromising, and yet we have laid before us this morning in your word this huge example of love. And it challenges us, Lord. And Lord, we know that we can't just go out in our own strength and just decide to love more and we're going to do this. But we need the empowering and enabling of your Holy Spirit. God, we see where we fall short. We see just how desperately and far short we fall. And we cry out to you. We call upon the anointing and empowering of your Holy Spirit to enable us to love a lot more than we do right now. And there is that great promise where Paul says, so that, so that, in the process, we may become far more righteous, far more holy, far more spiritual than we are right now. Help us to take your challenge to us seriously this morning, Lord, to not just let it be yes and, and, and it's wonderful and then we go out and forget it. But help us to continue to be challenged in this the most difficult of all things. Loving others. Easy to love you, Lord. Help us to love others, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.